In this video I'm going to be talking about procedural animations and showing you how to create a procedural walk cycle like you're seeing now. I'll be showing step by step how I've created this in Unreal Engine, but most of the concepts will apply to any engine whether it's a custom engine, Unity or whatever you may be using. I would recommend watching this video in full first and then trying to attempt it for yourself and maybe referring back to the video if you get stuck because most of what I'll be talking about is the thought process behind how we get to the end result rather than specific steps that you must follow every single time and hopefully after watching you'll be able to apply the same kind of concepts to figure out how to make the procedural animation that you need for your project. So to summarise what procedural animation is, it's animations created using a procedure and that means logic and variables as opposed to keyframed pauses that you would get from traditional animation. So because the animation is based on logic, that means it changes when you change the input and the variables. And one thing that you could count as the input is the environment. So if you change, let's say, the height of a step, the procedural walk animation can deal with that by raising the leg higher. Or if you choose to change a variable that's part of the system, such as the stride length, then you can change that and the animation will change based on what you've changed on the inputs. What this means is that once you've set up the system that you need, it can apply to many situations. So you don't need to make an individual animation for every single possible step height or every direction they might be moving or any direction they could be facing while they're going up the steps. You just make the system in the first place and then it can adapt to many different environments. So to start off with, I'm just going to explain some of the concepts that I'll be following, some of the techniques I use. So to begin, I'm going to start off by drawing a photorealistic spider. And what we want to do first is to make his legs actually meet the floor. So to do that, you find the position of his foot and find some point above it, let's say 50 units above, and then find a point 50 units below and do essentially a trace line from the top point to the bottom point. See where it hits something and that should be the floor and that's where you will place the foot. Then in the next stage, we're going to imagine that he's moving from left to right and we're just going to lock the feet in position. So this leg will actually be here and it will be locked back in place. So it's locked in world space. So wherever it is in the world, it will be locked there. And that will be the same for all feet. So all feet will be locked where they originally started, even though the body's moving. And after that step, what we'll do is intermittently move the legs forward. So from where they are when they're locked to where they want to be, which is the base pause, where they are in the base pause when they're relaxed. However, if we move it to where they are currently, that's already too late. As soon as it lands there, the spider carries on moving and the foot's too far behind. So what we instead want to do is predict a point where the spider will be in the future and move the leg from where it is now to where we predict it to be based on its current velocity. And then instead of the foot just sliding from one place to another and along the floor, at the halfway point, so at let's say 50% of the move, we'll just add some height to it just so it lifts up and we'll do the same for each leg so they lift in an arc and it looks a little bit more natural and it doesn't look like they're just ice skating along the floor. I'm using Unreal Engine 5, but if you're using a previous version, you may need to enable Control Rig from the Plugins menu. So the first step is to right click, go to animation and click on the control rig and select control rig as the parent rig. And I'm going to name this spider walk control rig and open it up and right click anywhere in the graph and search for set bond transform or just set transform and link the execution path up. And currently there are no bonds to use because we've not imported the rig. So go to Rig Hierarchy and click Import Hierarchy and select your skeletal mesh. Click OK. And now you should see the mesh in the small viewport as well as all the bones listed underneath. Um, so now when we go to the drop down of name, we've got all the bones that we can select. So I've selected Pelvis. And now we need to plug something into Transform. So right click and search for get transform and select the same bone, which is pelvis and plug in the transform and now things are back to normal and we've not modified the values. So open the drop downs for transform and plug in rotation and rotation, translation, translation, scale and scale and things are back to normal again. And then on translation, do an add vector and put in some number and you should see that the whole rig moves. So now what we're going to do is we're going to find a point that's above the pelvis and below and do a trace line or a sphere trace and find where it intersects, which should be the floor. 
and then position the pelvis at that location. So right click and do sphere trace by channel. And for the start point, we're going to do the pelvis location plus 150 on the Z axis. And for the end position, we're going to do an add vector again, but this time we're going to do negative 150 and plug that into end for the end of the trace. And now plug in the hit location to translation. And now you can see that the pelvis has snapped to the floor. So if we right click on the skeletal mesh and go to create animation blueprint, open up the animation blueprint, right click, search for control rig, plug in the execution path and uh, for control rig class on the side, search for your control rig class that you've just created, compile, and it should be working. So now we'll drag in the skeletal mesh, and in the details panel, you want use animation blueprint, and in the animation class or anim class, you want to select the animation blueprint you just created, and then if you simulate, you should see that the mesh is snapping to the floor using the trace line. If you open up the console and type control rig debug, you'll find this a.animnode.controlrig.debug, set that to one, and that allows you to use a debug drawing. So in this case, I've had a draw line and I'm just going to plug in the trace start and trace end to the A and B. So then we'll see a line which represents what the trace is doing. Although this will be drawing a line when the trace is actually a sphere trace, but we'll be able to see the path that it's taking. So now when you simulate, you should see a red line that's from above the pelvis to below, and that's what it's using to fan the floor, and then it's snapping the pelvis to that location. So I'm going to remove the draw line, because we don't need that now. Clean things up a bit. And next, we're going to search for basic IK and plug that in. And for the effector item, that's the end point of the leg. So in this case, it's L and score foot. And then for item B, it should be the bone above that, which is L and score calf in my case. And then for item A, you want the top bone, the top bone of the chain, which is L and score thigh. And as you can see, that looks uncomfortable. Um, but we haven't set the effect to target. So search for get bone transform and search for the foot bone and plug the transform in. And something has changed and it's trying to position the foot at the end point, but the rest of the bones don't really know which direction they should be facing because we've not set the primary and secondary axis or the pole vector. So for the primary and secondary axis, you can figure out if you look at the skeleton which direction the bones are facing. Um, and this may differ between different 3D programs. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think Blender will always do it consistently, but I'm not 100% sure on that either. Um, so you can have you can figure it out this way. Or what I usually do is just brute force it and take a guess at some numbers. So in my case, I know it's 0, minus 1, 0. And then it's 1, 0, 0. And it still looks wrong because it's going through the floor, but that's because we've not set the pole vector. So another high quality diagram where I'm going to show what I usually do to find the pole vector. So if you find the top of the thigh and the foot and the halfway point between the two, and then you project forward to where the sort of knee joint is, and you keep projecting that same line forward into the distance. And if that's where the IK target is, things usually work out okay. Um, I'm not going to do that in this case. I'm just, because it's a spider, the elbows, knees of the spider can all point straight up. So I've just put in for the pole vector on Z, 10,000. So now you can see that we're back to square one. Everything looks the same, even though one of the legs is actually using IK, but you can't really tell which one it is because it looks as it would in the default pose. Now what we're going to do is another sphere trace. And for this one, we're going to trace above and below the foot point and use the hit result to decide where the floor is. 
So if we get bone transform set to L and scuff foot, get the translation, add some number to it. I'm using 150. Then add again and do negative, I don't know, 150 again for the end point. And the hit location, we're going to plug that into the effector, but we can't plug it in directly because we're using the transform. So drop down both, plug rotation in, scale. But for the translation, we're going to plug in the hit location. So now you'll see that this one leg is actually meeting the floor as the other legs are intersecting. And when it goes up the ramp, you can see that for a short part of the ramp, it actually lifts up the leg, but then it drops down again because the start of the trace isn't high enough. I'll increase the value, so 450 and negative 450, so it traces from higher and lower. And now you can see that the leg lifts up quite a lot when it goes up the ramp. And excuse the lag on the recording, that'll disappear shortly, but you get what you pay for. So now I'm going to loop this process so we can do it for all the feet. So create a for each node and search for get children. And this will get all the children bones of the selected bone. So in this case, I'm going to use pelvis as the bone because that's equivalent to the root bone in my case. And you want to make sure that you tick recursive and what that will do, it will search for all the children bones of the children bones. So now we've got every bone and you can limit the type to search to bone if you want. Plug in the array to the for each loop, uh, control drag on the execution paths to move them like that if you want. Um, so from the element, this is basically looping through every single bone. So now we want to check if the name contains the word foot. And so all of the endpoints of the legs I've named foot and create a branch, plug it in and if true, continue on. So now it's limiting everything it does with the IK to bones that are named foot. So I'll drag up from the element and do get parent. And this should be the bone above it, which is the calf. Press C to create comments. And then the parent of that, and that should be the thigh. So now we want to replace all the bone names that we've put in directly with references to these bones. So the calf should replace item B, phi replaces item A, and the effector item, that's just the foot, and that's the one that we're currently looping through. So we can just plug that directly in from the element. And now we can see we've made a squid. Um, so at the moment, they're all pointing to the same place. They're all targeting where the L and score foot is because we've not replaced these references yet. So plug in the element to both of these and then each foot goes to where it should be. So now if you simulate, you'll see that the same thing applies to all the feet. So both of the front legs lift up until the trace doesn't work. Um, and I think if you move up and down the mesh you'll see that the feet are still trying to stick to the floor and the pelvis will snap to the floor if it gets low enough because of our trace where we're setting it to the floor so what I'm going to do is after we do the sphere trace for the pelvis I'm just going to add on some number so it's not literally on the floor it's just raised above some distance from the floor so in the Z I'm going to add on 150 and I don't know why I keep using that number. Um, but I'm going to use an if, which is essentially a select. And if the trace is true, if it hits something, then we use the trace result. Otherwise we're going to use the default translation of the bone. And I'm going to just increase these values. So it traces from higher and lower. So now we can see that the pelvis is actually raised off the floor. Maybe too high, but... So there's an issue with the foot IK, and it's caused by tracing from straight above the foot to straight below, but the leg's not actually coming from straight above or below, so you get issues like this where if it goes over an edge, it can snap down and the leg will actually intersect the geometry. To fix that, we can change the start of the trace to being a point that's closer to above the pelvis rather than directly above the foot. So in the traces that we use for the feet, 
I'm going to make a change to the start point. So instead I'm going to search for pelvis for the bone transform. And now you can see that did not help. Um, so I'm going to undo that. And I'm going to copy it instead and search for pelvis separately. And we're going to interpolate between these two vectors. So I search for interpolate, plug both in, and the T is the percentage between the two, so I'm going to do 0 0.5. So that's halfway between straight above the pelvis and straight above the foot. So now when we try it, we should see that if you remember to simulate before moving it, we should see that the feet, the legs don't intersect. They'll reach the edge and then it'll fall off when it's got room to fall off. And we don't get the intersection as much. It's not perfect, but for our users, it's a good approximation. Everything's still working as it should. And the legs are just snapping into place at the minute, but we can see that the IK is working and each foot is actually meeting the ground. So back in control rig, create a setup event if you don't already have one. So right click search setup event. This is the equivalent to begin play from blueprints. And we're going to copy the get children for each contains and the branch. And also the get transform interpolation and the trace. So we're going to copy all of that and move it up to the setup event. And what we're doing here is we're going to save each foot location, the initial location, to an array. So to do that, we need to put the hit location into an array. So we create a new variable. So on the left, click the plus and give it a name. So I'm going to call it world locked foot locations. And you want to search for a vector, make sure it's a vector. And on the side panel, make sure you've got it set to array. So I drag it in, search for get, do add. And we're going to want to plug hit location into the element, but we're going to use the if or select um, that we've used before. So it's essentially doing the same thing. So if there's a hit result, we will use the hit result. If there isn't, we'll use the default bone position. So I've just copied and pasted that there. Result goes into element. So plug in hit to the condition. So if it's true, we'll use the hit location. And if it's false, we will use the default position. So that should be the default position of each foot. Now we should have an array that has eight entries, uh, one for each foot uh, with their location. So now where we do the basic IK, instead of just plugging the translation in, we are going to unhook that and drag in the get world, whatever, locked foot locations, search for get or at and plug that in. And now because the index is zero, we've made the squid again because they're all pointing to the same place. And also they're all pointing to a place in the global space, which is actually rig space, different to world space. So in a setup event, after the condition, search for two world and this converts it from a global or rig space to a world space. The opposite of that is a from world, which does the inverse. And we're going to use that now to take it from the array back to the rig space. So we're dragging the from world node. And now you'll see that they're all locked to an actual world position. So when we move it around, all the feet are targeting the same place. Now what we want to do is make it so that each individual foot is targeting where they want to be. So we need to get the index of the foot. But from this get children node, if we just use the index from this array, that's including every bone in the hierarchy, not just the feet. So create a new integer. And I'm going to call this uh, current foot count. And make sure that this is an integer, but not an array. And before the loop, we're going to set that to negative one. So that when we increase it later, the first one will be zero and the second will be one and so on. So if it finds a foot successfully, drag in the current foot count and do set. 
then cut the execution path and then drag in the current foot count again, do get and do the integer plus one and plug that in. So now as it loops through the feet, it'll be counting up how many feet we've gone through. So then use the current foot count as the index for the array and everything's back to normal and the feet are locked to their initial place in world space. So when you move it around, they're all locked in place. And if you move it far enough, again, the squid. Now we're going to create a new function and we're going to call this calculate velocity. And back to Mr. Spider, who's now wearing his hat for another diagram. So if we imagine that he's moving from the left of the screen to the right, and let's say in the last update, one second has passed and we'll say that he's moved 200 units in that time. So he's moving at 200 units in one second, which is 200 units per second. But in a more likely case, the last update would be shorter. So he's only moved, let's say two units. And we'll say that in that the time passed to, for him to move two units is 0 0.01, which is one frame at 100 FPS. So the mass would be two divided by 0 0.01, which calculates back to 200 units per second. So now what we're doing is basically the distance or the displacement over the time equals the speed, or in our case, the velocity. So we can use this to calculate the speed that he's moving at frame rate independent. So to do that in the actual code, we're first going to get the transform of the pelvis. And we're just using this because it's the root bone so we get the bone transform pelvis and we want to save this location for later. So get the translation and we're going to get to use a two world to get it in world space, create a new variable, set that to a vector. And we will call this previous world location. And at some point we need to set this. So we'll do this towards the end of the function. We'll do set previous world location. And for now, we'll just plug in the world, the current world location. But what we want to do instead is we want to calculate the difference between the current world location and the saved previous world location to find the difference in position. So to do that, we do the new position minus the previous position. So that's the difference. And then we want to divide this by the time that's passed, which is the delta time. So if we do a divide, we'll see that's a vector and we don't actually have a divide by a factor. So we'll do scale by a factor, which is multiplying. So then we get the delta time. And because we're scaling, not dividing, we need to convert the delta time into a way that it will make it divide it. So instead of just plugging it in, we do one divided by delta time. And then we plug that into the factor, which should be dividing the displacement by the time. And the result should be the velocity. So we're going to save, a, well, we're going to create a vector called calculated velocity, drag that in and set that value to the value we just found. But we don't necessarily want it to instantly update the velocity. We want it to be a bit more gradual because if the rig is moving around fast, it might be jittering and, you know, with frame time differences. So we want to smooth it out a little bit. So if we get the current calculated velocity and we interpolate towards the new value, and if we use a number like 0 0.1, over time it'll accumulate and get closer and closer to the actual value. And we'll plug that into set calculated velocity. So back in the rig graph, what we're going to do just for a test is instead of using the bone location that we got from the saved array, instead we're going to get the initial foot location just from the default pause. So to do that, if we go to the array element that we're currently iterating through and we do get transform and tick initial and then get the translation and on this translation, instead of plugging it in directly, we'll do an add vector and we're just going to add on the velocity. And we'll plug that into the translation. So now 
we'll see. And nothing is happening. And that is because we missed a vital step of actually using the function. So um, we'll plug that in at the start after forward solve. And now we'll see that it's all pointing towards one location, which is strange. So from that, we can assume that we've done something wrong in terms of switching from world space to global space. And we have because we basically didn't do that at all. We named the variable previous world location, but we're not actually converting it to a world location. We're just getting the global transform of the bone. So if you drag out from translation and do two world and plug that into the subtract, we can now see that when the rig moves, the legs are moving forward. So if we move it at 200 units a second in one direction, the legs are moving forward ahead of that by 200 units. And this also makes a jumping spider. Okay, so back to control rig. Um, what we now want to do is actually use the world location that we've used from the array. So we can probably delete what we just added to test things because the calculated velocity appears to be working now. So we'll just get rid of that and we can plug back in as it was. And I'm going to duplicate the world locked foot location and call it world target foot location. So this is where the foot will want to reach when it steps. So now we want to create another function to actually calculate this value and put things into this array. So I'm going to call this calculate new foot targets. And what we're going to do in here is, well, firstly, we are going to copy some of the nodes from the setup event because we're going to essentially be doing the same thing where we're tracing to find the foot like landing spot. And we should have used a function for this, but I'm just trying to keep things simple and just do it one step at a time. So we loop through all the bones and find all the ones that contain foot and get the world location. But now we want to add it to this world target foot locations array. So we want to also clear this array before the loop, just so that it doesn't keep accumulating new targets and adding. So it only ever creates eight for one for each foot. So now before we add it to the array, we're going to add on that calculated velocity to essentially project it forward. And at this point, I should mention that another way to get the calculated velocity is just to input it from the animation blueprint if it's a non-velocity with a character blueprint. But this works for any situation when it isn't a character with a movement component. So at the moment we're getting an error. And that is because, well, firstly, we are calling the return node inside the loop rather than on complete, but we still have the error. And I've just noticed that I managed to delete an execution path at some point, so I've just put that back, but that shouldn't be affecting the problem. So what we can see is if we go to the output log, we can see that it's trying to access values outside of the array. And that may be because we're not actually calling this function. And now everything works as it should. So when we simulate, we're back to how things were that it's projecting forward at all times. But we don't want it to always be projecting the location forwards. We only want it to do that when it decides to lift the foot and it should calculate a new landing spot. So at the moment, just when we move it, if we remember to simulate, it's just moving forward. So we're going to make that more intermittent. So it only updates these values every so often. So as a quick test, inside the calculate new foot locations, or new foot targets. Instead of doing add, we're going to change that to a set. So set at. So that means that we can change values or not change them if we don't want to, rather than just adding to the array. 
So the element is still the same, but the index should be the foot index. And once again, we don't have direct access to the variable and we should redo a lot of this because this is just getting repetitive, but we'll get the current foot index and make that a local variable just so we're not messing with the previous one that we used. And within the loop, we're going to set that to whatever the previous value was plus one. And now because we're updating it, we don't actually want to reset the array. So let's just cut that out. And we're back to an error. So let's just set the current foot local index to negative one, just for sanity's sake, but we still have the error. And it's still saying that it's out of bounds when we're trying to update these values. And that's because we're using, well, firstly, we need to plug in the index that we haven't used, but also, this is an empty array, so we're trying to set values in a blank array. So in the setup event, each time that we add a new locked foot world location, we're also going to add, a, add the same entry into the world target foot locations, just to populate the array, just so it has eight entries. And now you can see that things are working back as they were before. And now what we're going to do is only set these values if a certain condition is met. So drag out onto a branch and if true, we'll set and update that value. Otherwise it does nothing. So just to test it, we'll get a random float. And if that number is greater than 0 0.9 or 0 0.99, then it will update. And you'll see that this doesn't actually work it will randomly snap all of the legs to a new location. But instead, it should be doing each leg individually. And so that's because for some reason in the loop, it doesn't create new values. So we're just going to seed it with the current foot index, just so each number is unique. And we can see that is sort of working. It's updating the new target locations at intermittent times and it's doing it different for each leg. So I'm just going to make that a little bit more frequent just so we can see that a little bit better. And even though the legs are snapping into place, we can kind of see that that's working. So what we want to do now is replace just this random thing that we've done as a test to actually use some timing. So we'll create a new float and we'll make that an array. And we'll call it foot timings. And since we've made a new array, so we don't get the error that we got before, every time we add a new leg in the setup event, we'll just add a new entry to foot timings. And we can leave the element at zero for now. So in calculate new foot targets, what we're going to do is whenever the foot timing gets above a certain value, we're going to create a new target point. So we're going to get or at the foot timings array. And the index is the index that we've already got from the local variable current foot index local. And if this value is above some other value, so, hmm, Let's do two. In that case, we'll update the target location. So every two seconds, it should update a target location. But this array is currently empty because we've just created it and we've set the values to zero. So what we're going to do is make a new function, which is going to increase the timers. So I'm going to call it increase foot timings, get the foot timings array. And for each entry in this array, we'll get the current value of the element and we'll set at the same index that we've got from this for each loop and we'll set the element to the current value plus the delta time. So that's the time that's passed since the last update. So every second that should increase by a second. And now I think if we test it, and 
not forget to use the function, we'll see that we're getting some errors. And that's because we've got a lot of loops going on. Um, and by default, there's some limit to how many loops that it can use. So if you search for limit, the node run limit, and we'll see that this is currently set to 64. And before we increase that, let's just make sure we're not doing anything stupid, um, which we are. We've got the return node once again in the loop, and that seems to be a habit that I've got. So I'll put that on complete, but we've still got the issue. So let's just try increasing the limit. So in class settings, change it from 64 to 128. Now it compiles with no errors. So any time that the foot index is greater than two, we're going to get a new foot target, but we also want to reset that value. So we do another set at from the foot timings array at the same index, and we're just going to set it back to zero. So now you'll see what happens is every two seconds, so rather than it being random, it's updating them all every two seconds. And because we're not differentiating between the different feet in terms of the timings, it's doing them all at the same time. So now what we're going to do is lerp between the locked location and we need the from world because it's a world location. So once again, we'll use interpolate vector and we'll interpolate it with the world to target foot location. And the alpha we're going to get from the foot timings array at the current index, which should be a number that goes from zero to two and then resets over and over again. So because it goes from zero to two, and we want it to be in a range of 0 to 1, we can do a clamp and clamp it so that when it gets to 1, it just stays at 1. And when the original value gets to 2, it resets back to 0. So now every two seconds, it will start to lerp to the new position slowly. But as you can see, it's snapping back to some old location. And that's because we're never actually updating the world target foot location array. We're only using the initial values we set on the setup event. So every time it finds a new foot location, what we're going to do is also set the value for the world locked foot location. And we'll use the same index. And the value we want to set it to is the current target. So the previous target becomes the locked location and we generate a new target straight after. So to do that, we just get the world target foot locations and the same entry from the array plug in the element and now we should see that every two seconds it just lerps to a new position. So I'm just going to quickly speed this up in the increased foot timings by multiplying the delta time. Uh, so I multiply it by four, so it should be four times faster than it's going through the loop just so we can see how things look. and. Now you can see that it's moving more frequently as well as the actual lerp is faster. And now because we've sped up the timing, it seems like the feet are moving too often. So in the branch where we're checking if the current foot timing is above two, instead we're going to do above four. So it should be twice as slow or half as fast. Um, so now we can see that the legs are still moving fast and it's more frequently finding a new location. And I think we want somewhere that's in between the two. So I think I'll try if it's greater than, let's say, three. And a lot of these numbers will tweak when we have added more features and made it look a little bit better because it'll be easy to tell if things are looking right or not. But we just want a baseline that's approximately right. The main issue at the moment is that all the feet are moving at once. And that's because we, in the setup event where we are now, we are setting the array element to zero for all the feet and we're increasing them all at the same time. So they always reach the maximum at the same time and reset at the same time. So instead, when we first create this array of the foot timings, we're going to do the index. So we'll do two float and then multiply that by 0 0.125 which is an eighth of a second. So each leg will be offset by 0 0.125. So now we can see that they're moving slightly out of time 
but it's not entirely clear what's going on there. So we're going to exaggerate things a little bit just so we can really see what's happening. So as it is now, you can tell that they're not moving perfectly in sync, but it looks almost like they are. And to fix this, or to just adjust it, what we can do in the Calculate New Foot Targets, instead of it being greater than 3, we'll change it to, let's say, maybe greater than 1. And now because we're doing greater than 1, the feet are always moving. And that's because we're using the lerp based on this foot timings, which is only going from 0 to 1. So every time it reaches its target point, it starts moving again. So what we're going to do instead of just the clamp is we're going to do a remap. And the remap node has a clamp option as well, so we don't actually need the clamp anymore, so we'll just skip over that. We're going to set the source maximum to 0 0.2 and leave everything else the same. So when it reaches 0 0.2, it will essentially be outputting one, which means it's reached the full target location. So now the feet move a lot faster because in a fifth of the time, they're moving the full distance. So now let's just plug delta time back in without the multiplier by three because things have already sped up due to what we've changed there. And now you can see all of a sudden, it actually looks like a spider walking to some extent. There's, it's not perfect, but at least when it's moving at low speeds, it kind of holds up. And if you do some weird direction changes, it probably won't. But for the most part, this is looking closer to what we're aiming for. But because we're just doing a straight lerp from one location to the next, the feet don't actually lift off the floor. So instead, before we plug it into the basic IK node, we're going to do an add vector and we're going to increase the Z height. And to do that, we're going to use a curve. So I'll search for evaluate curve. And this essentially takes an input and remaps it based on the curve. So we'll take the remapped result and plug that into the value of the curve. And because we want it to start and end on the floor, we want the start point and the end point to both output a value of zero. And somewhere in the middle, we can bring that up. It doesn't really matter where to, but we'll put it to one. And but we'll plug the result into Z, but that will only be adding one unit of height. So the target maximum, this is essentially scaling it or remapping it to 100. And now in the viewport, you can see that the legs are, well, lifting. And even though the spider isn't moving, it's lifting the legs and we'll fix that later. But let's just see how it looks when it actually is moving. So you may notice that now the legs seem to sometimes be intersecting the geometry. But it's only when they move, when, they, when they're when they stationary over the point, they actually work. But when it's moving, it's going underneath the surface. And this is because we're taking the hit result and then projecting forward using the calculated velocity. What we should be doing is projecting the end point and then doing the trace to see where the end point actually hits the floor. So in the uh, calculate new foot targets function, we're just going to move things around a little bit. So it should be before the trace instead of after the trace when we add on the velocity. So we'll just rearrange some of these. And we're going to add this onto the foot location before we do any of the trace. So if we plug in the translation to the add node and add it on, and then if you control drag from this, it doesn't seem to work, and I think that's because it's looped back on itself. So I've undone that, and I'm going to pl plug them in manually. So I'm just replacing the connections that already existed, and then the translation can go into A. And now it projects forward and then does a trace line from above and below that projected point to find the actual hit location and then saves that. So I think that should have fixed the issue we had. So now you can see that the feet are always actually meeting the floor when it's moving. And I'm just going to tweak the lifting of the feet. So 
if you right click on the points and select auto, then it will be more of a curve rather than like a linear change. Um, I'll just move things around so it lifts up at first and then it gradually drops down towards the ground. And I think that looks a little bit more realistic. I don't, we're not aiming for realism, but it looks less robotic that way. Um, you'll notice it still has the issue that when it's stationary, the legs are lifting. So we'll fix that next. So to do that, all we need to do when we've got the target maximum at 100, instead we're going to scale that based on the velocity. So I'll drag in the get calculated velocity, get the length of the vector, which is essentially the speed, remap that. So we can clamp it and the target maximum we want to be, well, it would be 100, but I'm going to try a little bit more. So I'll try a 150 and the source minimum zero. So that's when it's not moving and the source maximum. That is essentially the value that you expect it to come in at when you want it to output this maximum 150 value. So I'm going to say, well, I'll say 400 for that as the, the maximum speed that we expect it to be moving at and plug that into the target maximum of the curve. So now when we simulate, it's the legs aren't lifting when it's stationary, but when it moves, the legs are lifting. The next issue that I've noticed is that when the pelvis goes over the edge, it instantly snaps down. And that's because we're doing a trace from above and below the pelvis and just setting that position. We're not loping it. We're not doing anything fancy. We're just setting it to wherever it finds the ground. Instead, we're going to save the pelvis offset. So I'm going to create a new vector and I'm going to call it saved pelvis offset cunningly. And we're going to make sure that that's not an array. And we're going to set this value after we've transformed the pelvis bone. We drag in the saved pelvis offset variable and do set and put this after the set transform node. At the moment, we'll just plug in the same value as we're putting into the set transform node. But what we want to do is create a spring interp and what this will do is it will interpolate towards the target value with more of a spring look to it. So it can overshoot the value and it will sort of wobble back into place. Uh, so for the target, we have the actual target that we want. And for the current, we plug in the saved offset variable. And let's just see what that looks like first before we start tweaking the values. So you can see that it's actually dropping down slower. It's not instant anymore but it's not really doing too much. So let's just tweak some of the values. So let's turn down the damping and turn up the strength. So it'll move faster, but it will also have less, let's say friction for the damping. And now you can see that it's, well, it's quite bouncy. Um, that's maybe a bit exaggerated and a bit too cartoony for what we're going for. And so I'll tweak the values again to a strength of 2 and 0 0.5 for the damping. And that seems closer. Uh, it still absorbs some of the weight when it drops, but you'll notice that it's intersecting because we're doing a trace straight from the center of the pelvis. So if you increase the radius of the sphere trace, that should help with that. So it's essentially tracing a larger sphere straight down. So it's not a line trace, it's just a sphere. And now you can see that that's improved it slightly. Um, I'll probably tweak those values later, but for now that's good enough. But the legs are sometimes stretching out too far. So when we're doing get calculated velocity, we're going to clamp the length of that vector so that it limits how far it can sort of predict the legs forward. So we're going to set the minimum value. Um, let's just use zero for that. And the maximum we're going to have to tweak this number. So we'll just try things out. I'll just make sure it's working with a low value. So now you can see that when it predicts forward, the legs aren't moving very far. They're basically staying close to the body. So I'll try 1,200 and we can see that it's limiting it, but not too much. And we might want to reduce that later, but for normal movement speed, that's not the main issue at the moment. 
The main issue is that the legs get locked behind, so when the body keeps moving, it's stuck far behind. So to fix that, we're going to get the World Locked Foot Locations Array and the current index, and subtract that vector from the vector for the location of the pelvis. So what that's essentially doing is finding the distance between the pelvis and where the leg is locked. Now, if the length of that, after we've subtracted it, is greater than some value, then, so in this case, I'm just going to use the same value, so I'll use 1200. If it's greater than that, then we'll also use that as an option for when it should decide to move the legs. So we've used that, or if the timer reaches the time when it should reset the leg anyway. So we'll try that, and as you can see, it's not working very well, and it's oh, it's resetting them all almost instantly because we've done something wrong. Uh, so let's take another look. So instead of finding the distance to the pelvis, which is not where the foot is, it might make more sense to get the position of the bone. So I plugged in the item, which is the actual foot bone, so it finds how far it is from where it actually wants to be. So that's where it was on the base pose, and that seems to have improved. But there's an issue now that if they all reset at once, because it's moved too fast, they all get reset on the same timer, so the legs become in sync. So they no longer offset using the cycle timer that we had, um, because they all reset into the same position. So I'm just tweaking the values just to demonstrate that. So you can see that they're all in sync and all the legs are trying to move at once, because they all leave the distance, or they leave the area of where they're trying to be at the same time. So I'm just going to play around with the values to see if we can get the range right. So I'll try going back to 1200. And that seems about right. It's not going to work in all situations. Dep you know, if they move too fast, there's there's no way that the legs are going to make sense when it's moving that fast. Um, but I think the main issue is that all the legs are syncing up. So to try to fix that, there's there's probably better ways to do it, but what I'm going to do is, instead of setting the value to zero of the timer when it resets, I'm going to set it to a negative number. Um, and that's only in the case if the reset is because it's out of the range. So what I'll do with that is I'll get the index for the current foot as the seed, so that it's always different. And we'll set some minimum and maximum values just so that the timers get reset to some random offset variables. And if that's the case, we plug it into true, otherwise false, we set it to zero, because that's just a natural reset. And now you can see that even though the legs are moving out of their range at the same time, they still stay out of sync, because we've added some randomness to it. And to help with this, just to avoid the issue happening in the first place, when the velocity gets to a certain level, it's going to increase the time speed. So I'm getting the calculated velocity, the length of it, and remapping that value. So this will speed up, essentially, when it increases the time, as it'll increase the delta time that it increases by when the, calc when the calculated velocity increases. So essentially, the cycle time is relative to the actual speed that the character is moving at. And I'm going to use the same, except the inverse of that, for scaling the clamp. So now that when the legs are moving faster, it brings it scales down the length that we clamp at, so the legs can't stretch as far in the event that it's moving at very high speeds. So when it's moving slowly, that seems to work okay. If we move it too fast, the legs are still getting stuck behind, but that's mainly because we're saving a global position and not a local position, so the legs aren't moving locally. And that can be difficult to explain, so I'll try and demonstrate that better, because this will come up in a lot of projects. So, if we imagine the spider, once again, is moving from the left to the right. The position of his leg started off over at this side, and now has to lerp all the way over to where it is, or where it's predicted to be in the future. So, when the spider's here, the position that the leg wants to be at is still back there, because it's only through some portion of the move, so the lerp is still saying that the leg wants to be far behind, because it's still locked in world space, far, be far behind the actual spider. Whereas if we switch to local space, the arc is now all within the local space of the spider, or the global space, rig space, if you want to call it that. So wherever the spider moves, it's still making the same arc, regardless of where it was locked in world space. 
So to do that, essentially what you would do is find where the leg is in local space, even though it's locked at a world position, find where the local position is for that leg, and then set that as the new starting point in local space, and then predict forward again in local space, and then make it do the arc, and then when it lands down, you switch back to world space and lock it in the world space location. And that's quite complex and not something we're going to do for this project because it doesn't need it. But you might find that with certain walk cycles and certain speeds, and especially with human characters, that it looks a lot less natural if you're, everything's based in world space and you're not switching back and forth between local and world. So back to reality, uh, we're going to create a new function and call it calculate average foot location. And what we're going to do is basically loop through the legs as we've done before, get the average location of the feet, and then we're going to use that to try and make the body move a bit more naturally. So it will try to move the pelvis towards the average position of all the legs. So if some legs are a bit far forward, the pelvis will move forward. If they're to the left, it'll move to the left and so on. So essentially we're just adding the vector of each foot position to a location tally where we just keep adding on to the same value and then later we're going to divide it to find the average. So before we return from the function what we want to do is get the location tally which is all the locations added up. We're going to create an output for average location and we need to know how many times we've added um, a vector to this tally. So we'll create an integer feet counted each time we add something to the tally, we'll add one to that value. And then before we return it, we do get location tally, and then we divide it. And we're going to divide it by the feet counted integer. So we need to just convert that to a float, and we'll just plug it into x, y, and z. And then we get the average location of all the feet. And then we need to call that function somewhere, but I'm not going to do it before we start moving the feet around. I'm going to do it after all of the loops. And the reason for that is we don't want the pelvis to move after the legs have moved because then the legs will also move along with the feet. So essentially we're doing it at the end of one tick and then we're going to move it at the start of the next. So we call the function at the end and we're saving it to calculated average foot location vector. And now what we're going to do is instead of using the pelvis location as the trace, we're actually using this saved variable. So it will try to move to the saved location and as you can see that when it moves, the pelvis is actually moving away from the natural center point because it's spacing it around where the legs are. And that looks a little bit more organic and when it stops, it moves the pelvis into position and it looks a lot less static and more realistic. And we're still using the spring interp for where the pelvis moves to. So it's not instantly snapping to the average location of the legs. It's gradually getting there using the interp. So hopefully you've found some useful information from this video. Uh, if not, let me know in the comments um, and I'll delete it. And if you have any questions and things you need clarifying or suggestions for other videos in this format, then let me know in the comments as well. And in the future, I may do a short video showing how I actually made the spider model I've been using here in Blender. Uh, because I did record that whilst I was doing it, but it, it didn't seem relevant for this video. Um, yeah, so thanks for watching. Like and subscribe.